Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Ted Stewart. Hey, thank you so much for joining and being here uh, with me today. Uh, today's topic is going to be about getting failure rate data for motor controllers. Quickly, as the abstract, uh, you know, most final element devices like valves, actuators, and relays, they are readily available within 61508 certification. Now, model specific failure rates. Uh, now, uh, it, it seems as though these motor controllers, when we when we do these types of certifications, they're getting left out, and the motor controllers are actually an important part of many safety instrumented functions. Of course, you know, like all these electronic devices, there's dangerous failures that will occur, and therefore it's important to get realistic data for these motor controllers, and that's exactly what this webinar is going to do. And we're going to discuss uh, basically variations of generic data. Uh, certificate when you go through a certification process, how you get the failure data, uh, and and then if there really is a true need for this type of information. Before we get started, we got a couple quick intro slides. Uh, real briefly about myself, uh, you guys are here for the information, not not because of me, <laughs> as much as I want to think so. The I worked for Lockheed Martin uh, when I started off my career as a test engineer. I then moved over to Harris Corporation where. I was uh, I helped manage and manufacture the, uh, about 14 different classified products that could locate and track people. A lot of fun. And then about six, seven years ago, uh, I came from sunny Florida to the corporate headquarters of Philadelphia, where or outside of Philly, where Exit is formed uh, solely for this job, and it was probably the best decision I've ever made as far as my career is concerned. I now am responsible for new product development, whether it's OEM functional safety and user functional safety, cybersecurity, automotive machinery, robotics, uh, and railways. So I stay really busy. I have a lot of fun. Uh, and every day we come into the office, there's there's probably a new fire to put out. So I never get bored. Exa, we are a global company. We have offices around the world. Every year, you probably see one of these little Exa triangles pop up on the map with our most recent one being Exa Israel. Uh, fingers crossed by the end of this year, another triangle is going to pop up. I'm really excited about the next location. I uh, can't talk about it just yet, but uh, hopefully December time, time frame, uh, we will be talking about that. We are a customer-focused company. Uh, we're the only company that encompasses that complete life cycle of functional safety and cybersecurity. And really, I mean, this alone kind of makes us a very unique company, and we bring a lot to the table. And the unique thing about our company is that we are in an employee-owned company. What does that mean? That means everyone that works for Exeter has a reason, right? Not only just to work for someone to, to you know, make a salary and keep moving, but now we have a reason to give it our all. Everybody at this company wants to succeed, and if Exeter succeeds, they succeed. So it's a really unique opportunity here, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've grown so fast. Uh, I think we're close to 150 global experts. Uh, I know we're over 100 now. Uh, we've completed over 1,000 certification assessments, and of course, we've modeled over 500,000 SIFs. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, well, anyways, to make everyone's day easier, kind of in my opinion, talking about Excellentia, it's kind of how it got developed. Really gone are the days where we were using simplified equations just because you know, you didn't want to have to make a user error on your Markov model. Excellentia, it's one of those things that allows everyone to focus really on building that optimal system instead of really finding out why their equation doesn't seem just quite right. <laughs> and if you're using those simplified equations still, oh, I just hope that you're still in your preliminary design. <laughs> We've heard some stories. Uh, Excellentia is uh, one of the most widely used global tools in the industry. I'm talking about it because today we're talking about failure rates, and Excellentia has almost everything to do with failure rates. And we just really want to just say, I don't, I don't know if we take enough time, but we do want to say thank you to everyone that's giving us this feedback to improve this software tool because we're constantly updating it based on that feedback. And one of the, the one of the most important improvements that we've made is we now have an intelligent lifecycle integration. What does that mean? It basically means we now have a module or a subset of Excellentia for every, uh, for each and every phase of that life cycle. And it's not only just for functional safety, but it includes alarm management and cybersecurity. I know we all hear cybersecurity over and over again now uh, because it's a real thing. It's happening. And, um, you know, all the methods and data that we're publishing uh, are really for everyone's benefit. We, we really want to be that open book 
Uh, we're kind of known for that. Just like this webinar today, you didn't have to pay any money for this. We do this every single week. We're sharing as much knowledge as we can. Why? We want to strengthen this marketplace. We want to fill those voids and, and make people realize what's going on because the faster we teach you and your colleagues, the faster our research team can begin, begin working on the next safety initiative, which really helps improve this industry and makes us all safer. And that's kind of our, our goal. Uh, as you succeed, we succeed. We keep pushing because that's where we can we can we can put our research money is into that next thing. Uh, I mean, this slide it kind of it's it, it, the picture kind of says it all. We're here to stay. You know, every day we're working towards making this pie chart a whole, <laughs> uh, and we thank all of our loyal customers that trusted us. And of course, you know that same pie chart goes for cybersecurity services. Uh, we're man, I love cybersecurity. It is such a unique uh, industry. And it's so much fun seeing how people are protecting the systems now and how it's a living thing where uh, you might go through this process once, but because of all these uh, attacks getting more sophisticated, it's really neat to see how our guys are finding ways to mitigate or even prevent some of these cyber attacks from occurring. Okay, let me get on today's topic, right? I got through those intro slides. Um, so now I'm here. This is what everyone's to hear about. We're going to talk about uh, our statistical research on how common motor controllers are used in safety instrumented systems. We'll then talk about the, the three different barriers of certification. We'll, we'll talk about how you get this failure data uh, when you certify. And then of course, if there's nothing out there, what can you do if you need to use in, in, a, in a system? Uh, where's this generic data and how do we get this generic data to begin with, right? Now, before I move into the next slide, just so everyone realizes there is a question toolbar uh, please use it. We had a lot of questions this morning, um, so I expect the same today. Uh, all right, so let's get moving here. So based on that statistical analysis of over uh, 80,000, oh, it's on the screen, 82,000 SIFs, right, that we've analyzed, 16% of all safety designs used an electronic, or electric, excuse me, final element. That means one out of six SIFs rely on this this final element. Now, there's there's different barriers that engineers are facing when they perform this SIF design. Now, when the end user is choosing a device to incorporate into their SIF, there's three major barriers that they must kind of hurdle over to say that the SIF's in compliance with 61511 uh, and, and to really achieve that SIL rating. The still level of our product is determined by what? Three things, right? We, we know these things that are the systematic capability rating, the architectural constraints for that element, the PFD average calculation for that product. And each of these requirements, it's a barrier that must be considered to achieve that SIL rating for that SIFT. So now let's kind of break these down, kind of briefly discuss on each one. Okay, the first one that we just talked about was the systematic capability. There's two ways to jump this first hurdle, prior use justification, and 61508 certification. Prior use justification may sound easy, right, until you start reading 61511. Sure, it, it, it might be simple for a valve, an actuator, where it's used all the time in this application, but when we start talking about a motor controller that has to be used in a low demand application, right, so it's, it's kind of out of that machine safety mindset where uh, it's 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 in this high demand thing. It's always occurring. No, we're talking about when it it only has to when it only has to work when it's in that safety function. Okay. So when when you listen when you when you read the standard of 61511, here are some things that come to my mind um, when when I'm reading it. You know, the first thing I think is, okay, well, are the manufacturers who uh, who make these motor controllers do they have a quality management system compliant to 61508? Do manufacturers, do they, are they tracking the shipments? Uh, what about the return information? Now, if you talk about the end users have, I don't know, do they have enough operating hours in the field within that same operating profile? And even that physical environment, are they able to justify? To what extent, what I say, does the rigor have to be if the information above is accessible, right? Let's say, okay, I check all the boxes. I was able to do all of that. Now, what's to say that was enough rigor. For example, what level of detail do we need for the documentation, the identification of requirements, 
exactly how many volume how much volume is needed for operating hours because nothing is stated in this standard and it's not as easy as anyone um, especially if you're an employee creating this justification you're not familiar with these two different standards 61511 and IC 61508 uh, it, it's just not as easy as it seems. I know for us, when we do uh, uh, proven in use or prior use, or even Route 2H, right? Route 2H, right? I mean, we're we're looking at if you're you're looking for a still two compliance. I mean, we're we're talking at least 10 million uh, operating hours. And here at Exida, you know, we always like to do 30 million on, uh, as a conservative approach. But just think about that. And so the other way is that 61508 systematic capability rating right so it's established by what it's it you need to have uh, a quality management system audited per 61508 if the quality management system meets the requirements of this standard a SIL rating uh is issued right and so this SIL rating though it's achieved depending on what the effectiveness of your quality management system so the more robust the more requirements you can meet in the standard the higher SIL rating uh that you can achieve what are the things that people look at? Well, it could be, you know, well, how do you source your part suppliers? How do you make modifications? How are returns and recalls handled? Things like this, that's usually what's uh, handled at this point and considered. Now, when a motor controller becomes certified, the systematic capability of that device is shown where on this certificate. And I got a picture there. Uh, for you just so you can see it now without this product certification this barrier becomes what it becomes very hard for an end user to meet it they're going to need to go through that uh, prior use justification which we talked about in that previous slide causing i mean it's really it's a great deal of time and and i essentially think it's money loss uh and it, but it but it is a huge relief and it's also a selling point for those manufacturers if they can provide a certificate to an end user because it gets them over that first hurdle without having to do anything, right? And so this product becomes more desirable. So then when we start talking about that second hurdle in architecture constraints, this hurdle is completed by what? It's by following – there's different paths that you could go. You could go Route 1H. You go Route 2H. Yes, we have webinars on these that go into greater detail. So if you don't understand these two different uh, paths, uh, send me a quick link. and I'll send you a 15, 30-minute uh, discussion on those two paths. But Route 1H, quickly, it, it involves calculating that safe failure fraction for the element. Uh, really, uh, a type A device, like a contactor, motor contactor, that's usually typically one component of a final element of that safety instrumented function, that SIF. Right, and that's that's type A. Uh, now there are different SIL tables, so keep that in mind. Uh, with depending on what standard you're looking at, if you're looking at 61508, if you're looking at 61511, and really that's what determines the architecture constraints depending on what SIL rating that end user uh, needs for their SIF. So I hope that makes sense. The other side of it, when uh, a manufacturer goes and gets this product certified, what you'll see is that the product um, certificate would let the end, user, end users know how to calculate this architecture constraints by using that table of 61511 and voila you know if you see this certificate here that number two hurdle is once again taken care of for that customer so when a manufacturer has this product certified boom it's already done so hurdle one and two of three are finished for this end user they don't have to even do anything Right, it's kind of nice. Now, notice on this certificate that hardware fault tolerance, which is what it's redundancy, it's stated, and this is what informs the customer if they might need to use two contactors uh, when developing their SIF, or maybe they don't. You know, depending on whatever um, SIL they're trying to achieve. Here we go. Hurdle number three: the PFD average calculation. Or just PFD average, right? This is this, this a calculation. It's an equation given to the standards that use nine different variables to achieve the probability of failure on demand. PFD, now it's based on the dangerous failure rates, the systematic diagnostics, the proof test coverage, uh, test intervals, maintenance, and, uh, and other conditions that are controlled by both your product and how the customers use your device or element. Now, from the product certificate, the end user can take the failure rates of the device 
And with the knowledge of these variables that they control, that is so key because they control, not the manufacturer, uh, things like how often they will be testing the SIF. Uh, they can now they can now calculate this PFD average for that SIF. And it's very important to note that this PFD average, look, we're not in the machine industry right now that we're talking about. We're talking about a low demand application. It's not a value that the device manufacturer should be providing. There are too many of the nine variables from the equation that will be assumed, and providing this value will really, uh, well, it, with, with all these different assumptions, can be very misleading and dangerous. We've seen it done before. We've seen people take um, a 13849 certificate and try and apply it to a different industry where it's, it's, it's used in a low-demand application, and this is extremely misleading and very dangerous. Uh, when a motor controller is certified, all right, what happens? Well, these, pu these, these failure rates are now published. This is the, the backside of that certificate, um, and it's based on the predictions, right? So an FMEDA, if you're referring with a, a failure mode effect diagnostic analysis. And if you're an end user and you see a, P P a, PDF, a PFD, excuse me, average number, remember to make sure to do your own calculations. Uh, you don't want to ever assume that whoever created that equation uh, was thinking about your system, your specific system in mind, uh, and, and do your own equation. But really, all you need is the failure rates, and then you can figure everything else out pretty easily. But the failure rates are very key in order to putting your system together. All right, so we got through the, diff the, the three different barriers. And what I like to do now is let's start talking about where you find this, this information. Right, the, these failure rate information, and like all equipment that's used in a SIF, a motor controller must also be justified based on this safety integrity. Now, the good news is, is that the industry is starting to evolve, and to it's to a point where we're now working with different motor controller manufacturers to certify them to the 61508 standard. <laughs> Yay! Finally, <laughs> and uh, so these certified uh, safety devices. They really are a special class of products. They have a, an amazing advanced automatic uh, diagnostic that really can detect many of the internal failures. It's fantastic. And uh, valid 61508 certified devices are maintained uh, where you see in front of you, it's called SAEL, the Safety Automation Equipment List. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll quickly show you how uh, to find the motor controllers that are going to be certified or that are certified and then um, where the future ones will be located. So what you do is the first thing is you, you basically click on the link uh, that you see in front of you, and it's going to take you to the, to the landing page that you see in that on, the, on this, the right side of your screen. Once you click on functional safety, it takes you to here. You click on the drop-down menu bar that says elements at the top. You then go to final elements, right? And then you – here, I can use my – you go to elements, final elements, and then you come down here to motor control, and you click that. When you click that, you go and you get to see now all the different motor controllers that are certified to 61508 to date. <laughs> and no, you don't have to scroll. Uh, there's one company right now that got through the process, uh, and it's your E300, which they're taking uh, – they have a huge advantage over the sense that they now have a certified motor controller here. And um, – that's applicable in low demand. Now, we do have a handful right now that we're in the middle of the process. They should be finished by the end of the year, so that's fantastic. Uh, so this list will be growing. But once, I said, once again, don't get this confused because, you know, in the morning session, we did have some people asking, well, no, I know of other motor controllers that are certified. You do, but if you look at that certificate, I can almost guarantee it's going to have things like IEC 62061. ISO 13849, that's also added on there, and that, and that informs me that they were really uh, certified um, in a high-demand application where they probably use cycle testing uh, to establish failure rates. Uh, I can almost guarantee that on the back page of that certificate, all they're going to see, they're not going to see failure rates listed. They'll probably just see a PF, uh, PFD uh, number uh, for them to use in their system, which is another telling sign that it's, it's for a high-demand product or system, excuse me. Okay, um, so end users really, uh, if you have to use prior use justification for a motor controller uh, for a system that's not certified, 
it really puts that end user in a good amount of risk on that end user because there's really no information um, for them to use as far as the failure rate's concerned. That's kind of what we did here is that because we realize there's a, a, a void in the industry and one of the things that we do with one of our, our research teams is we try and think, okay, well, if people don't have this information, we don't have anything certified yet or we don't have this data yet in uh, Excellentia, how can we get more of a generic uh, system up and rolling and, and hey, by the way, can we have an upper and lower bound so that people know, hey, it should be somewhere around here for our failure rates. And that's exactly what we did here. The industry's growing. So this website, www.silsafedata.com, it's a great place for you to now go get generic information. And it's really going to help you uh, when there's no data pr present uh, for whatever you're looking to add into your system. All right. So normally um, what we do is Sil safe data, it's brought up and analyzed. And we get questions sometimes from people that say, well, look, that's great. You created this website, but how well, how, how do we know? where these upper and lower bounds were generated. Where does this information come from? And so I kind of want to share a little bit with what we do and how we generate these numbers. So if, if people on this, this webinar didn't know, we do have a database and that database is growing all the time. Uh, every project we do, it, it grows more and more and more. We have well over 200 billion unit operating hours of actual field data that we've collected. Um, this data, after we get it, it's compiled into a component database, which then is used to create Calibrate FMEDAs. Uh, Calibrate FMEDA, what does that mean? It basically means as products advance, as they prolong in life, we're learning about what these components are doing. So even if there's greater technology, you can't just assume fairy rates are going to go down. In some cases, newer technology doesn't mean it's more reliable, it just means it can do more things and they're actually breaking more. So uh, depending on what type of component it is, that failure rate may be increasing or decreasing, and therefore we calibrate our FMEDAs to make sure that these predicted failure rates are accurately displayed in the field. So as these field returns come back, we're, we're reevaluating everything that we're doing, making sure that we have the, the best predicted failure rates as possible. Another thing that we do with this data is we use this database to compare to other respective industries, uh, one of them being ARITA, Right, and so as you see those uh, little circles there, those are here with the cursor here. All these circles are different um, databases in a sense. You have the ARITA database, CHEM. You have the Power Field Failure data, and then of course you have the FMEDA statistical analysis. So all these things are then looked at, and uh, they're compared to. Uh, we have we've had numerous trips where we've flown to the the different organizations that that run these uh, databases. We've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, trying to align databases, making sure that, hey, their predicted rates are, are reasonable to what we're doing, vice versa. Uh, if there's discrepancies, we try and get everything corrected because why we want to make sure that the if you don't have good data, your input and is not good data, then your output's not, not going to be a good result. So when you create an FMEDA, it's only as good as that data that you're receiving. And so this failure rate information Yes, we are nerds. We love this stuff, right? <laughs> so this failure rate information that we love, it's the backbone of our company. It's the backbone of everything we do because if you don't have great prediction, predicted failure rates, you don't have anything, right? You're just producing stuff that it really isn't reliable anyway. So that's what's so valuable with this, this, this tool. And so anyone that wants to check the validity of a failure rate for a product, even if you're a person that doesn't know anything about functional safety. One can now have a place to go to and compare the numbers to see if they fall between two limits, right? If it's 1,500 is a lower limit, if it's a 750 that they see on the back of this thing, hey, that falls between the two. I'm good to go. I don't have to understand anything more. At least it's a, it's a fail safe check, so to speak. Here's a snapshot of still safe data for motor controllers. And it's important to note, and really not surprising, that just like with valves, all motor controllers they're not created equal. They have different sets of values. It could be anything as much as the voltage differences. It could be, hey, is it a smart device? Is it a mechanical device? All of these things play factors. And you can see here in the motor overload relay, right? You have a mechanical one and you have a smart one, right? And if you look at here, look at the different lower limits and the upper limits, okay? So that's something that you can look at. If you have a mechanical uh, motor overload relay uh, and it's just generic, you don't have any other failure rates, 
this will help you look at your dangerous undetected failures and say, okay, so between 100 and 400. So it's kind of nice. It's a, it's a great little tool to use. Okay, now in summary, uh, and then I got a ton of questions to answer here. Um, we did analyze over 80,000 safety designs, okay? And of those, like I said, there were 16% of them that needed an electric final element. One out of six relied on this final element. And of the electric final element, 92% were motor controllers, motor speed interrupts, and motor starters. Think about that. And I only showed you one product that was actually certified. <laughs> now, who knows if, how people did their prior use justification. I'd love to have a conversation with somebody and, and on how they were able to come up with that because we are constantly learning. Uh, we, do are, we are creating more and more FMEDAs for people as their first initial step just so that they have failure information to use in the systems. Uh, this topic has become so valuable that we now uh, well, me personally, I'm going to be doing a couple more webinars and building upon. So this was the first one, right? So I'm going to do another one on September 4th where I build on it, where I talk about why these dangerous, uh, why these motor controllers are being ignored in SIFs. And then, of course, I'll do another one specifically because we've had many requests on the STO function on how it's used really in a motor controller. So let me go ahead and get to these questions. Uh, we do... Quickly, I have some uh, training slides here, or training slides. I have, uh, there's different trainings. Uh, if you need some kind of information, make sure that you, you take a look at our, the trainings here. We now offer online trainings, right? So you don't even have to leave your office or cubicle. Hey, come see us. I threw this one in here, sorry, I liked it. Uh, we are going to a few different shows. Not sure if you're gonna be there as well, but we'd love to see you, come say hi. Hey everybody, thank you so much for uh, attending today. Uh, you guys are great. Thanks for the awesome questions. Uh, if you have more, you have my email in front of me. Uh, and we're going to have some more webinars. So uh, please, please, please uh, put these down in your calendar. I'd love for you to ask some more questions. This is a hot topic and we need help. We need more people to be asking questions and getting this rolling because we need that information. All right. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye for now.